Hello, and welcome to another episode of The View. It is the end of January, last day of January here, and I'm excited that we'll be talking to folks in Florida who worked on um, passing Amendment 4, restoring the right to vote to a number of folks in Florida that we'll be very excited to hear about. But first, we'll introduce ourselves, and then we're doing this new thing. We started last week. It was Christina's idea, and a really good one, to have kind of a UU roundup, what we've noticed is going on. And you may have noticed other things, so chime in if you did and you're watching. Christina, how are you? I'm doing well. I am not in the polar vortex, but we are feeling the, the elements of it. Um, it was six degrees uh, last night for us, which is just completely ridiculous. <laughs> and, um, but I feel for you all who are even more northernmost than, uh, than us. Uh, it was just really cold. And as an administrator at a UU congregation, um, nothing strikes terror in us more than the slow walk into church um, in the morning as we think about all the pipes that could be frozen or uh, things that we need to attend to and knock wood. It was great here. So I'm really grateful. Uh, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Michael Tino here from Peekskill, New York, which um, at two degrees is the third coldest place of the people here on The View this morning, probably. Um, I'm guessing it's a little chillier where you are, Margalee. Um, life, life is okay here. We've had, there was no school yesterday because there was 15 minutes of a blizzard. And uh, today we had a two hour delay. So I am just getting into my day here at 11.02 a.m. Eastern time. How are you, Aisha? It is 8.02 here Pacific time in Seattle, uh, so I'm still drinking my coffee, IV, of course. Um, I'm Aisha Hauser. I'm in Seattle. It's it's not a polar vortex. I think, I don't know, it's in the 40s maybe. I don't think it's the 30s. So yeah, sorry, we're having a heat wave over here compared to y'all. Um, but I did want to mention when we get to it last night, uh, Black Lives Unitarian Universalism hosted a theology panel that was just, I, and I had to leave early because I was leading a class at, at the church. No, so. Asia, you're jumping in. We're going to talk right. about that. Never mind. Really? Yeah, okay. we are. All right. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself now. We're going to talk Bye, a everybody. lot about that. Yeah. All right. I'm done. <laughs> Marga Lee is here still learning. Uh, the ropes, Margaret, what are you doing today? The ropes might not be a good, a good phrase to use. I apologize for that. What are you doing today? You're muted. I know horrible that, oh. there, finally, I'm unmuted. I do this all the time. I'm horrible that I'm muting myself. So hello, this is Margie Lee coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut, and we are at eight degrees. So, you know, this is, it's also a heat wave here. We're nowhere near those minuses. Um, so what I will be doing today, I'll be the one monitoring the Facebook page and um, engaging you and post, uh, posing your question to the panelists. So that's me and who hasn't gone yet? Jessica. Yeah. Hello, yes. I am I am here. Um yeah, well, you know, Margalee's doing the the uh, heavy lifting today. So so I got us going. I will um you know, probably just answer any questions that Margalee has and um yeah, happy to be here. And you know, I mean it's 8:04 a.m. So I won't tell you when I woke up this morning though to get prepped for the show. So um yeah. Great. Happy to be here. And one of our guests is here, Reverend Patrice Curtis, who used to be one of the hosts of The View back when we started, actually, and a former learning fellow at CLF, and now the minister in Clearwater of the Clearwater UUs in Clearwater, yeah. Florida. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you. It's uh, very nice to be back with all of you. I remember these days. I am now in Eastern Standard Time. I used to be in Pacific Standard Time. And used to be moaning about getting up so early, but 11 o'clock feels fabulous. <laughs> so the weather here uh, is a balmy 50 something, which for Florida is kind of Florida cold. Uh, but yeah, we're, we, I, I actually, uh, my spouse 
uh, is from Omaha. And I said, hey, we should go to Omaha just so we can experience like minus 50, you know, <laughs> with wind chills back there. <laughs> they weren't too keen on that. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't get my bragging rights as a Minnesotan here. It is actually balmy here now. It's only 17 below and there's no wind. So wow. that's amazing. Yesterday, when I woke up this morning, it was 28 below. So it's going up all day. We're going to get up to minus two. And I'm so excited. But um, yeah, it's been cold. It's been cold. But, you know, people here just go about their business. I didn't. I didn't leave the house yesterday. I didn't. I didn't do anything. I mean, I worked just like I would work any day. Telecommuting makes it hard to have a snow day or a cold day, sadly. But but I didn't open the door <laughs> and um, it's, uh, it's gonna be okay again. We're gonna be back to our usual really cold things, but not the really like 60 below wind chill that we had. But people were out, I mean, my girlfriend went to like a driver's training class to get a discount on insurance yesterday. And I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you doing that? But that's Minnesotans, they do stuff like that. I see we've been joined by Desmond Mead. That's fantastic. Desmond is with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. And um, so we're delighted to have you here. Desmond? So I have been on for a while. Oh, um, you've been watching. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why my video wasn't showing up, but I hear you all bragging about that nice weather you're having up north, right? <laughs> and then Patrice, uh, uh, I don't know. Listen, it is cold in Florida in the 50s, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not even play around with it. <laughs> but um, no, I am happy. I'm happy to be on. I was just, I don't know. I have a new computer, so it has a mind of its own. And mm. I would decide to let me, uh, let my video be displayed. Well, we are delighted to have you. And we'll be talking to you in just a few minutes about the restoration okay. of the vote in Florida. But first, Asia, say more <laughs> about the Theological Symposium last well. night. Well... <laughs> Um, it was, it's a, it's a, it's something that Black Lives Union Entire Universalism is going to do each month leading up to um, a conference that they're hosting in October. So this one um, included, there were six panelists, and I'm not going to remember everyone's name. And like I said, I only could see the first hour of it. It went on for two, but Chris, Christina, you saw it. Um, it was, was an extraordinary, oh, you were there. Yeah. Last, last night, night, yeah. Last night um, was open to all, everybody. So yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you, everyone could, I just was so blown away, even just the first hour that I was able to, to view. And I was, um, just appreciative. And one of the, one of the lines that popped out at me was, um, they were talking about it being a white, Unitarian Universalism being a white centered faith. And one of the panelists said, it's not white centered for me because my center is black. And so I bring, I come to this bringing my whole self and I'm the center of, you know, this, of the, my faith. So it was so compelling. And I really have to just give a shout out to Reverend Kimberly Hampton, who named um, my, um, I don't know what the word is. The word isn't unease, but my, you know, Mary, Mary Oliver is wonderful, but she named for me, she articulated that her poetry is, is, it's not rooted in liberation. It's not about, I mean, it's it's beautiful for what it is. It's like kind of having a beautiful flower and it's not rooted to everybody's experience, um, especially those with marginalized identities, at least that that's how it speaks to me. So I just appreciated she lifted that up in terms of talking about theology. So that's all I'll say. It was, it was I can't wait to watch the second hour. I loved it. Christina, yeah. what would you like to add? It was amazing. Um, it was beautiful in, in both addressing that Unitarian Universalism is regarded as, as a predominantly white faith, but also decentering that whiteness in this conversation about, um, they titled it, Whose Faith Is It Anyways? Um, and really bringing out both some of the historical, um, you know, information that it, it, you know, the contributions of, um, of black folks, you know, theologians, and um, ministers and culture in our faith, um, but also just not just as a way to say, see, we're important too. Um, there was a, a quote of like, well, who's the black Emerson? And, and that's not what we're talking about, right? We're not trying to talk about um, the black contribution or the POC contribution as it relates to whiteness. Um, we are trying to recenter this to, um, 
be the fullness of our faith. Um, and so that I just, I, I was tremendously impressed by, and I am going to name the, the folks that were on there because everybody has um, different people that they want to uh, listen to. So if you're listening or talking or watching The View, and any one of these names really interests you, you should definitely head over to the Black Lives of UU site where it was reported. And uh, so they had Dante Hillard was on, Ian Hill was on, uh, Kimberly Hampton was on, Jero Farrar was on, um, and Stephanie uh, Mitchum was on, and it was moderated by um, uh, Takia Amin and oh, Michael Slack. Michael Slack, thank you. I mean, there was one more on, and it was just it was just fabulous. It was it was um, an hour and a half, I think an hour and a half. It, it was uh, just really great, not just affirmation, but you know, um, there were a lot of uh, white folks who were watching. And that was wonderful. And I also really appreciated that um, white folks and non-Black POC, um, you know, didn't try and make it about us, um, and really just, you know, were there for what for what uh, was being shared. So everybody should go check it out. Yeah, and I'll just say, as one of the white folks who were there, there were a lot of religious professionals there, which made me happy. And the mission of Blue is to support Black Unitarian Universalists, but I want to say that that holding of a theology that's universal like that is really good for me as a white person. And I know I'm centering myself right now, but I just want to say this, that that, that work benefits everybody. It, it is so, I get my faith back when I hear that work because I didn't, you know, somebody said I'm a blueitarian or something like that. I, I remember the blueitarian blue universalist, you know, and I thought, you know, I'm not, I didn't join the whiteitarians. That's not who I ever wanted to join. But that's unfortunately what we get a lot. And so I feel like this, though, the rest of the um, monthly things will be for black folks and great. That's, that will be a whole different quality, I'm sure. Um, I was really grateful to be welcomed there, and it there were like 15 sermons there. I mean, there was just so much that was theologically deep and powerful and liberating for everybody. So, um, yeah, it, it was the time just flew by. I kind of thought, well, I'll turn it on, but you know, we'll see. But I was riveted. I mean, it just, I, um, it was one thing after another, just really compelling. And yes, several of the people there, I hope will, will be future guests because they said very provocative things I wanted a whole show on. So anyway, so um, I also wanted to mention the court case um, about no more deaths, which criminalized humanity, which said it was illegal to give water to people dying of thirst on the border. And Patrice, I know you've been down to that border. I wondered if you'd Talk about your experience down there and what you saw. And yeah, I went on a College of Social Justice trip um, as a, a program leader for religious professionals, actually. And as part of that, it, it was uh, almost a week long. And as part of that, we actually walked out um, into the desert, uh, taking uh, water and, and food to fill up the caches, you know, as people come through and things go down. So, um, you know, of course there's slightly a feeling of, uh, you know, we're just going down there for, you know, for a day, for several hours, you know, it's completely different to think about actually walking through there. And there really is, you know, no water, no food. It really is extremely hot. And I just, one of the things that we learned had been going on is some of the Homeland Security folks had, when they were out in the desert and finding these caches of water and food, were actually spoiling them. There are actually video of them, you know, puncturing the, the water jugs that had been carried out there. Um, and now they've, you know, they've been, there's been a movement to try to make assisting people going through the desert to make that illegal. And it's just, I remember when I got back from that trip and I would encourage anybody who can possibly do that to try to do that, um, to try to experience that. And you don't, the College of Social Justice puts on a wonderful 
trip, which allows you to meet a lot of different people. Those who are affected are really centered and we heard a lot of them speaking. But even if you just drive your car down there and, and volunteer for a nonprofit, so there are different levels of engagement. But being there and hearing people talk about their journeys, um, talk about how they are, what they are escaping from as if anyone would ever choose to do that just because, oh, this sounds like fun. Let's go do this. You know, let's let's take ourselves across this border. Let's take our kids. Let's risk death. Uh, there are nonprofits that go out and they find bodies all the time. I mean, this is real. This is real life. You know, this is real life and death. And I remember when I came back from that trip that I actually wrote an open letter to the people who work at Homeland Security, the people who work on the border. And it was just an open letter from one human to another human being, you know, for, for them to realize kind of, these are real people, you know? And yes, you have a job, but is it really the job you wanna do? And do you wanna resist even within your job, you know, doing certain things? So it's, it's, uh, it's really sad. So there's that, and a lot of people can't go down to the border, don't have the ability to do that. So we know there are our congregations that are doing sanctuary work and our sanctuaries uh, or are part of a sanctuary city movement. And there are congregations who don't even have that possibility, which is where we are in Clearwater. There is no sanctuary city movement. There is in St. Petersburg, which is only about 15, 20 minutes down the road from us, that's a very different city with a very different vibe, a lot more progressive. We are here more in a, um, a, a balanced, progressive, conservative, maybe slightly more conservative area. I certainly see, you know, huge uh, flags on the back of pickup trucks and things like that once in a while, not very often, but every once in a while. So what our congregation does is that we offer um, ESL classes for Arabic speakers, particularly, specifically. So there are ways to, uh, to resist um, uh, what's happening, what's coming out of our politics at the moment. Uh, and sometimes you can just do something right at home and it's slowly gaining traction. It's, it's growing organically, word of mouth. And we just have you know, few students trickling in all the time. And it's just been, this is our third year, I think it is. And it's really blossoming. We're beginning to be known around town. So we had a UPS driver come in and see one of our signs and say, oh, I heard about you. You know, just thank you for being here. We've had several people from the community say, thank you for being here. We have a huge sign on our wall, which was taken down twice before we got a metal sign. <laughs> so there are ways to for all of us to be a part of the of the movement of uh, recognizing um, that these are these are real people who if they could do anything else they would do something else, something else you know and for me it's interesting you know I worked in volunteering refugee camps so I've seen that side of it so it's it's been a real learning for me to be on on this side of it. And I never thought that I would, I just never thought that I would see what I'm seeing as far as closing our borders, closing our doors to people. It's still a little shocking to me, honestly, so. Thanks. Well, I hope it doesn't stop being shocking to all of us. You know, I mean, when people say this isn't who we are, I think there's a lot of evidence that it is who we've been and who we are, but it sure as hell for me isn't who we want to be, so yeah. Um, uh, anything else in the UU world? Trust is meeting now. I know they're having a steering committee out in Arizona, actually, I think in Tucson. So um, uh, we wish them well and hope to have somebody from Trust come and talk about their study soon. Um, the board met. Christina and Tim baked while the board met. We did. We had a most recently resigned from the UA board uh, weekend. So I went and met with Tim Atkins, uh, resigned from the UA board, I think it was a week ago, maybe two weeks ago now, um, um, you know, because the, of a decision that was made 
um, that was just antithetical to his understanding of um, our Unitarian Universalist values. And, um, and that was, you know, a really difficult decision, I'm sure, for him to make. Um, and we both just felt like we needed to do some, some support of each other. So we, uh, we had a great, great weekend and, and posted a little bit about our adventures so folks could follow along at home. In the, and I now know how to make the infamous uh, Tim Atkins caramel. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. That's great. And they um, all roads lead to CLF department, Tim, who used to work at CLF. Patrice, what were you going to say? I was just going to ask if you, if uh, people are excited about Richard Blanco coming, uh, Spokane GA. Might have, you might have already talked about him. We haven't, no, and I am excited about that. I'm inspired by him. Uh, the poet who read at one of Obama's inaugurations, yeah. Was he the youngest or the first Latino? He is there. There was a first. He was, both. He was the youngest. He was. He was both. He was the he first youngest, the first Latino, and um, first, first openly, gay. openly LGBT. Openly gay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's move to our guests. I'm really excited about today's show because, in the midst of good news and bad news coming out of the fall election, there was some really good news from Florida that reflected some really good organizing that went on. And Desmond Mead, I hear you were in the center of all that. So I would love to hear your take on how you did that because hopefully other states can learn from Florida. Well, listen, I, and I'm glad you said that. I, and first of all, let me uh, thank you all for having me on uh, today. It's definitely an honor and a privilege to be in the um, in the company of the UUs, right? Because you guys make it happen. Um, uh, Unitarian universities have been strong supporters of this movement from day one. From I remember back in the day with Reverend Gail Tapscott. Uh, down in South Florida, uh, inviting me to uh, speak to her congregation, uh, all the way up to uh, getting people like Brigham Johnson, who is a force to be reckoned with. Um, it's been uh, an amazing ride uh, in Sarasota, um, just in, in other parts of the state, just meeting some beautiful people and doing some amazing work. Um, let me tell you, so what we've seen, and I like to start off by saying that what we were able, what this world and this state was able to witness on November 6th was something that was remarkable, um, something that was beautiful, something that was transformational. You know, Amendment 4 got over 5.1 million votes, and that's over a million more votes than any candidate on the ballot received, right? And the beautiful thing about it was, was that those 5.1 million votes that we got, none of those votes was based on hate. None of those votes was based on fear, but rather those votes was based on love, forgiveness and, and redemption. And so, but for a moment, the state of Florida and this country got to see love winning the day. In, this, in, in, in the age that we're in uh, now with the, with the divisiveness and, and all of the hate that surrounds us and the, the partisan back and forth, which nobody wins, to think that an issue as so-called controversial as felon voting rights, being able to pass with overwhelming support uh, is nothing short of miraculous. And, and, and I tell you, it speaks to the fact that this campaign started out on the right foot because it started from a spiritual space, right? And from a spiritual space, it first thing it connected with was with people. That this is about people over politics, people over race, you know, people over hate, people over all of that negative stuff. And we connected with people along the lines of humanity, you know. And, and, so and can and you so deepen it, into how you did that? Because but I'm that's it right there it in very strategic ways. You know, yeah, and and and. and and believe it or not, if we just, I think it was a natural inclination that uh, it's a just, we followed a natural path. We didn't follow a man-made path. We didn't follow a political path. We followed a natural path. And that natural path told us that 
the issues that we were dealing with impacted people from all walks of life, from all political persuasions, from all racial backgrounds, and that the solution to it would be to bring together people from all walks of life. And because I am with a person of faith, you know, I was immediately uh, uh, taken to the, the passage in the Bible when, uh, when Christ was on the cross and when there was a, a criminal that was next to him that asked him to be saved. You know, and I always tell folks that Jesus didn't tell him he had to wait five or seven years. What Jesus said was, this day you shall enter the paradise. And that interchange right there actually spoke, uh, it spoke to the heart of all faith, whether it's Judaism, whether it was Christianity, whether it was Islam, it spoke to this very basic foundational concept of forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. And so that's how we move forward. We move forward in that light and lifting up people. And so we refused to be labeled a bipartisan movement because we weren't. We were an organic grassroots movement that welcomed and enjoyed bipartisan support. And we were able to get people who the experts said was gonna be our enemies and they end up endorsing. How do you get the Koch brothers to endorse this? How do you get the Christian coalition to endorse this? How do we get, you know, several of the young uh, uh, Republican uh, clubs in Florida to endorse this? Because this was put together along the lines of people, along the lines of humanity. I got great examples of that, that doesn't even relate to the ballot initiative, but it speaks to why we were successful. And you could all relate to this, right? Give you two examples. Number one, one of the most beautiful times that you see humanity at work is after a natural disaster, right? After the hurricane, people come together. They don't care about who, how you voted. They don't care about what you look like. What they care about is another human being that's in need. And those are those moments, man, where we see humanity or our country at its finest. Uh, uh, just to get even a little closer personal, we're driving down the street and we see an accident on the side of the road and there's somebody laying down there and we decide to stop and help and we get out the car and we run up to them. The first question that we're not, we're not going to ask them, did you vote for Donald Trump? You know what I'm saying? We're not going to ask them that. We're not going to ask them how much money did you make? Do you own a business? You know, we're not asked. What are we asking them? Are you okay? And how can I help? That is humanity at its finest. And that was the spirit in which our campaign embraced. And, that, and that's why it allowed us to bring people from all walks of life together in such a, a, a form that no one dared attack us because they, there was nothing to attack. What they were gonna say, you know? How could they speak out against some basic tenets that lays the foundation for all of our faiths? And so, we were able to, um, and, and that's why when you see, you know, we have right now Governor DeSantis, he's our governor. You know, what we know is this, in, in, even though that race was decided by around 15,000, I mean 30,000 votes, over a million people who voted for our amendment also voted for him. The thing about over a million of people who voted for the, our current governor also voted for this amendment. And so it showed that it was able to appeal across all spectrums in spite of the fact that it was no opposition, but folks in the back of their head were saying, oh, this is a Democrat thing, or oh, this is a progressive ploy. And, and, but the reality of it, for once, we've seen people vote for their self-interest instead of against their self-interest because they wanted to vote along party lines. And so that was a beautiful thing. I believe that, um, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, we just got through celebrating um, um, his legacy. Uh, but one of the things that always stuck with me was that what he said about you, how you couldn't drive out hate with hate. You know, you couldn't drive out fear with fear. That how that love of that all empowering force that, that is able to drive out, you know, the hate and the fear that light drives out darkness, you know, and I do believe that there's something, there's a secret sauce that's there that would that other states can look to, that this country can look to. And I'm hoping that this win could be that spark that slowly turns that big ship around and starts to change its course. 
that we don't have to be at each other's throats because that gets nothing done. That if we can just only seek to find that common, that common bond, that common uh, uh, hum, bond along the lines of humanity with each other and transcend partisan bickering and racial insecurities or anxieties, that we are, we're capable of moving major political issues. Because what we just did in Florida is tremendous, tremendous. That's gonna have a, 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 a sizable impact on this country for decades to come. Right. And, and, and we did it with love. We did it with love. And so that's that's our thing. And then so what happened um, would come around um, after that. You know, we had the media that tried to stoke up fears. Um, you know, I'm going to feel like Donald Trump on this one. But, you know, the media was actually creating stories where none existed. And they were creating this sense of fear that, you know, they had some folks thinking that supervisor of elections was going to have barricades in front of uh, of their offices and prevent returning citizens from going to register to vote on January 8th. And the, the reality was the exact opposite was true, that all throughout the state of Florida, some uh, offices even had balloons put up to welcome us. It was a huge celebration. It was a celebration of expanding democracy. And it was also, a, once again, a celebration of love because the same people who voted for this amendment out of love went with their loved ones to witness them registering the vote. You know, and we had a guy who voted, who, who registered. The last time he voted, he, he voted for John F. Kennedy. Could you believe that? It's been that long since he voted. Uh, we've had people who voted, who registered for the first time because they lost the right to vote before they even was old enough to vote. And when they went to go register, guess what? They went with their son who just turned 18. And so father and son was registering together. And it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, so many folks throughout the state was like shedding tears of joy. You know, um, it was a momentous moment. Matter of fact, I'm gonna tell you how it was. It was so huge that in many media markets, because we, the day that we were allowed to register for the first time, was also the day that the governor was um, sworn in the office. That story got second billing to our story of love. In many media markets, he had a small section and we had the front page, tire top of the section there. And they're talking about returning citizens registering for the first time, you know, and, and the confetti in some of the offices and the balloons and, just, you know, it was a joyous uh, occasion. I think it was a great time for our country. You know, we've seen folks. And, and, and one of the things that you know, I told folks when we was doing the campaign was, listen, we're fighting just as hard for that person who wished they could vote for Donald Trump as we are for that person that wished they could have voted for Barack Obama. At the end of the day, we believe that every American citizen, right, once they pay their debt, should have the opportunity to be able to vote. And when we seen people coming out of the woodworks uh, on January 8th to register the vote, that's exactly what we saw. You know, one of, the, one of my favorite moments was when I was in the parking lot and I hugged Brett Duvall. It's on Facebook, it's on my Facebook Live. Brett Duvall is a conservative voter. He loves Donald Trump, he's a hunter, you know, uh, 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 but guess what? He's my brother and we were united together along fact that we both have paid our debts and wanted to re-enter into society. And just to see he and I hugging, you know, we didn't see race. We didn't see, you know, uh, uh, political differences, if there are any, you know, but we didn't see any of that. What we saw was another human being. We saw a child of God, you know, and that was that almost that same image of when you seen that during the uh, after the, and then aftermath of the Texas, of the hurricane that hit Texas. When you've seen that African-American with the boat rescuing the white guy that stopped to let the white guy go back and get his Confederate flag, right? That, that even though we know what that flag stood for, that African-American guy was able to overlook that for that moment because what he seen be, before he saw that flag was that there was another human being that was in need, right? And, and, and that to me is, is something that we must continue to embrace as we're moving forward you know, we're still uh, working through some implementation issues 
um, at first the our legislature and the governor erroneously thought that we needed implementing legislation to, uh, to implement uh, uh, Amendment 4. Uh, most of what he was saying was just out of plain ignorance. He, did, he didn't know. Um, and the people who the media was talking to were people who had nothing to do with the campaign, had nothing to do with the clemency process. And they were talking just to appear like they knew what they were talking about, but they were saying the wrong things. And the media knew that. And they wanted to play that because at the end of the day, that's how they make their money by selling stories. They have to be sensational or controversy in order for them to actually be relevant. And so we were able to overcome that and, 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 and continue to move forward. Uh, our organization is constantly in conversation with the leadership, uh, both conservative and progressive leadership in the state. Um, and we are slowly moving uh, issues forward. People have registered. Uh, there are a lot of supervisor of elections offices that have experienced a spike in registration. Uh, and we're looking to actually launch a much larger and more comprehensive registration effort um, in the state. We want to be deliberate because we want to make sure that we're not just registering people. We want to make sure that people who are registered actually turn out and vote because that is what makes our democracy vibrant when they're voting, not when they're registered, but when they're voting. And so I'm going to stop here because uh, I know so there much. may be some questions. Yeah, well, I'm huh? going to ask I'm going to ask Reverend C Patrice Curtis to just chime in a little bit with her perspective, yeah. and then then we'll sure. move into some questions. Sure, Patrice, you were in Clearwater working on this. We were, and it was uh, actually one of the most invigorating uh, efforts that we had during the the campaign year. We uh, our congregation was was uh, really all in. Um, we had uh, held. Uh, um, opportunities for people to come and to call and talk with folks, which I did. And that was uh, what I found is that when talking with people about Amendment 4, I found that what resonated with people was the idea of second chances. And I think part of that is um, not only based in love, but it is also, and I think this is what gave it power as well, based in the American ethos, right? We, there is this sense um, that being an American means that you have, you know, that you're, you're given chances to try and try and try again. And uh, I felt like that was a huge message that, that helped people feel that how could they deny anyone a second chance when they knew that they had had second chances themselves so I think that language was really um, effective uh, in, uh, in talking to people about this. I also think another thing, uh, forgiveness was also part of that. Uh, redemption was also part of that. And I also think that the campaign was, was very effective in showing, uh, in showing the, the broad swath of people who, who would benefit from this. So I remember one of the TV ads that I saw that I thought was really effective was actually of a Euro-American family. It was a young man who had, um, they had a, a baby girl or boy, I don't remember, a couple years old or something, and his wife. And they, and, and you know, that kind of became the face a little bit of the campaign. And so it was countering in this really beautiful way the, the idea that only black and brown people we're going to benefit from this and only black and brown people um, were in, you know, were in prison. And so I think that was incredibly effective. Uh, Meg, you were asking, you know, sort of like what really worked. And I think some of these, the ideas um, that Desmond spoke so eloquently about it is making it, uh, getting to that human part of us, but also getting to that American cultural part of us. It says everybody has everybody should have an opportunity. You know, it was kind of like that. You know, everyone is supposed to have an opportunity. You know, so I think it really tapped into that that sense. Um, now we are, as Desmond said, now we're in this in this time of being incredibly hyper vigilant about what happens now, about who actually gets registered, and I uh, know that. Um, that a couple of our folks at the, the annual NAACP uh, MLK breakfast of which 
um, my congregation is very engaged. We do the march, we help serve breakfast, et cetera. We had a little table there um, just letting people know that they could register to vote. And we had one uh, uh, grandmother brought over by her grandson to register, someone who had not been able to, to vote uh, in decades. Um, and she was, you know, there were tears in everyone's eyes. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's that, it's such a wonderful feeling to be able to see one of our UU principles, you know, the democratic process and to actually be engaged in that particular principle, which is one that, you know, we sort of don't always have the opportunity to be directly engaged except for our voting, but to be able to be a part of registering someone and just to, you know, watch what's going on in Tallahassee um, and to see the machinations that have gone on, which Desmond mentioned, to try to to slow up, to stop this this movement. I mean, I think the governor even suggested to the counties that they hold off on registering people until you know they could sort of figure out what was really going on. And as you heard, they said, <laughs> "Never mind that. We're going forward. We know we can do this." So for Unitarian Universalists, as we begin to approach another election cycle, uh, we'll be looking for opportunities to just, you know, be there to help register people um, as needed. Um, and just to assist, you know, Desmond's group has always been, you know, at the head of this and we're just kind of following along and trying to provide um, support and people where we can. So I'm looking forward to you know, it's something like 1.4, 1.5 million people in Florida who we think are eligible. Can you imagine if we could get three quarters of those people registered? It would just, it would be amazing. I mean, all would be great, but realistically, 75% would be, you know, absolutely fabulous. So it's rare to be part of such a movement like this where it's so positive, where it was so um, breaking the bounds of bipartisanship and politics and just to be a part of creating a new law, you know, that was based on something so deep as, you know, love, forgiveness, redemption, you know, second chances it was fantastic. So I really should thank Desmond for the opportunity that we had to be a part of that. It was really amazing. So I have a question. Do, so in order to do that kind of phoning, I, I'm thinking that what you're describing is a movement that you are building in the trainings, in the gatherings, in the get out the vote stuff. Um, was there a script that you were using to deep so that people could learn how to have deeper conversations? Because typical scripts are not really deep and meaningful uh, tools. No, <laughs> that no. That 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 kind of reminds me of um, when I um, was in D.C. a few years back on the anniversary of the March on Washington, and they had a program talking to one of the old time um, uh, civil rights leaders that was in the background that didn't have as much uh, notoriety as, as, as MLK. But uh, they was talking about how they were speaking to the lady, and they was asking her, "Hey, you know, did you guys do some research or polling?" you know, before deciding this civil rights movement thing, you know, and she was just smiling and just saying, no, no. Did you do any focus groups? No, no, we didn't do any of that. Do you have scripts? No, we didn't have scripts. And they said, eventually she said, we just knew it was the right thing to do. You know, um, I think that when you're, when you're coming from a, a, a pure place, um, you know, I think that everybody, there's a, Every one of us have, you know, this thing inside of us about wanting to be forgiven, wanting to be loved. And, and you know, because I rarely found anyone that said, hey, listen, I don't ever want to be forgiven for anything that I've ever done ever, right, in my life. And so coming from a, just a, a very natural space to where just talking to people about if they believe in second chances, you know, do, you know would they ever want to be forgiven? Do they know someone who's made a mistake before, you know? And, and should that, you know, and then one of our main uh, uh, talking points have always been whenever debt is paid, it's paid. Once the debt is paid, it's paid. And folks shouldn't be made to um, continue paying a debt that's already been paid in full. And so 
that was what drew drove the the heart of the grassroots movement. Um, and the the thing about this campaign was it was different because it was not driven by the consultants and you know and the and the experts. It was actually driven by the people on the ground. It was driven by people who are directly impacted. It was driven by the grassroots movement and that made a whole lot of difference. What you've seen in the TV ads was a reflection of what it was in real life on the ground. Um, those, the people that you've seen were not actors. They were real people, uh, up a trees, real people. Mm -hmm. That's part of, they were members of the FRC, you know, yeah. uh, never had any training. They was just themselves, but just being their authentic self was enough to connect with folks because it wasn't a hard sell. It was not a hard sell because when you talked about the issues, the values about debts being paid and forgiveness, you know, that's something that resonates with every person, you know. And so that's I think we were able to to overcome so much because of that. So let um so as a a as someone who was both sort of a foot soldier and then also did some uh, a little bit of press. We had no, I had no script at that time when I was, when I was, you know, speaking at a, a rally or something about what I should say. But I will say though, and you kind of have to do this, that when you have people actually making phone calls, everyone has, we all have our own bias. We all have our own words, particular things that we think would be effective. Um, but we did actually have a, a, a script and the script was, interesting to me because it it steered away from, as Desmond said, any sort of uh, bipartisanship. It really tightly focused on, uh, have you ever been offered a second chance yourself? Do you think others should have a second chance? And that was really the heart of the conversation. And one of the things that they explicitly asked us not to do was to try to convince anyone of anything um, and they really asked us to pretty much stay very tightly to that script. And that was in the, I think that was a learning, that was a learning as they'd gone through and they'd figured out where it can go astray. Because of course, if I call someone and, you know, I have an idea about what I'm going to say, you know, um, and it may be skewed politically one way or the other. So I think it also points to the fact that this script was for anyone, no matter where they came from on the political spectrum, uh, but it allowed, uh, but it sort of stripped all that out and really got down to the heart of the humanity of it. So yeah. Who's I mean, they? You were, you were referring to they said, who's they? It's, uh, I don't know if it was Desmond's particular. The, particular yeah, it was a campaign, it was a campaign team. Yeah. The um, campaign. So we, yeah, we had, a, we had a, a, a group of folks that would go around and and help train folks, you know, um, it's called a message triangle, uh, making sure that folks, you know, were hitting the three main points uh, that we wanted, that the campaign felt was important to hit. And then also giving pointers on what to do if you're phone banking, what to do if you're canvassing. And what so to second, do- I have a question related to that, Patrice, to related to that very tight messaging. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm going to try and frame the question well because <laughs> you could frame well, it unwell if you want. <laughs> I'm going to try. Well, because I think I I love the idea of really getting people to understand, you know, second chance and the humanity of this. And yet, I know so many of our black and brown siblings are in not for having for for not having done anything. That yeah. there is so much injustice in people being incarcerated in the first place mm -hmm. um, that to me, when, when I hear that second chance, it's, it's, it's a difficult message to hear because I'm like, sure, if you had done something and, <laughs> and you, and you just, you know, you're asking about somebody's humanity to have a uh -huh. second chance, but there's so many folks who literally are incarcerated because they're black mm -hmm. and brown. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, and, and I'm not trying to, I'm not, 
please, uh, here, I am not criticizing the work that you all done. Because no, you no, 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 go ahead. I, and, I love and it. And I, I want to know how we're, like, my other question is, how do we scale this to, you know, bring it to other places? Okay, but, so. But, but can, so, can you speak a little to that? Yes, I would love to. Let Desmond so, go, and then I have something, a way to ex expand it. Yeah, because first of all, I think that speaks to uh, a message discipline, right? Because what we were concentrating on was the restoration of voting rights, right? Yes, we could have so easily gone into conversations about overcriminalization of people of color, uh, people that's wrongfully convicted, but that wasn't the issue at the time. And we had to stay focused on that particular issue and not go down the rabbit hole because it wasn't going to do anybody any good. And we lost focus, or lost sight of what the real issue was. That's number one. Number two is even on those issues like that, one of the things that we, we, well, one of the things that I wanted to do from day one was I wanted to destroy all of the myth that surrounded uh, felon disenfranchisement. One of them that a lot of people were surprised about was that in Florida, uh, uh, less than 25% of people with felony convictions are even sentenced to prison, all right? And so when we're talking about, when we're talking about the, the, the people who are impacted, overwhelming majority of them are not coming home from prison, right? But what happens with our criminal justice, even with our criminal justice policies, it is framed around the prison population, right? And because of that, it creates narratives that are not necessarily accurate, right? And, and, and so here we are trying to strategize about how to fix a problem, but we're looking at, like say, a fraction of a population that's impacted by the problem. And so that, that, that does throw us off a little bit. Um, it had folks thinking felon disenfranchised with African-American issue. Well, African-Americans only accounted for a third of the people who couldn't vote in Florida. And so there were a lot more people that looked like Brett. That was a guy that you see portrays with his uh, wife and, and daughter. But there were way more people, twice as many people that looked more like Brett than looked like me, you know? And so we, we had to be able to deconstruct several myths, which opened up, actually opened up, I think, a pathway for us and other issues. Now, as we're moving towards CJ reform and reentry, that really allows us now to have them cast a much wider net. Because if we only set our strategies or framework around the smallest majority or that 10%, then that means we leave a 90% population out there that's not being spoken to, whose needs are not being addressed. And then somebody like Donald is gonna come along and speak to them. And guess what? They're gonna go with who's giving them attention. And so what we realized is that, wait a minute, there's just people out there that just need that we need to have conversations with and are hurting just like I'm hurting. I know I'm an African-American man that, listen, that I didn't have my rights, but that, that does not minimize Brett Duval, who's conservative and whatever, who don't have his rights either. That doesn't minimize his pain and his desire to be with his daughter on a school field trip, his desire to feel like an American citizen. And so, we were able to just stay real uh, uh, focused in on that and to be able, in such a way that we brought in a much wider net. And because we were able to bring in a much wider net, we were able to garner much wider support. I'm, I'm so inspired. I could, I could listen to you all day, doesn't much need to say that. Um, and, and one of the things, so uh, at the congregation where I am, I'm, I'm, I live in Seattle and the congregation I serve is, um, in Bellevue, but one of the things someone, a member brought up recently was the idea of not alienating a Trump supporter in our congregation. And one of the things I responded to, and you've been speaking to this whole time, is I said, I talk about my values. I talk about affirming yes. the humanity of every person. I'm not, I'm not, my frame of reference isn't who votes for whom. It's, mm. this is who, what I affirm and promote as a Unitarian Universalist. And um, hearing Reverend William Barber a few years ago was what kind of oriented how I speak now. And I, um, 
I, I, so that, I mean, that's just so, that's what I'm trying to reinforce over and over as much as I can't stand mm -hmm. 90% of what's happening politically. Um, I appreciate your framing and that's what we have to continue to reinforce. This is about humanity. This is our, about our values. This is about who we are yes. as people because that speaks yeah. to folks. So thank you so much for this work. I'm, I'm yeah. in awe. <laughs> somebody so, asked me, I wanted to, somebody asked me, I wanted to oh, say, so, so Christine, I wanted to say um, that you are, um, you are right on and for Florida particularly, we have the highest exoneration rate of folks who are on death penalty, uh, as who are on death row, the highest. There have been 28 people who have been, who are innocent that have been released from a death sentence, not just prison, but a death sentence. And um, the Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty is one group that is really trying to show that at a minimum, we need to get rid of the death penalty because I know, we know for sure that this state has put to death innocent people. And a lot of those, as we know, are black and brown, not exclusively, but a lot of them are black and brown. And so, yeah, there is that tension uh, between those who have been wronged. And we knew that we had to stay on message really, really tightly. And, um, you know, we had no idea. We were very hopeful. But I have to tell you that personally, I had in me a little core of skepticism, a little core of skepticism that would actually be passed. And that makes this uh, victory all the sweeter because of that. Despite it not covering, you know, everyone properly, despite the fact that we know that we have to continue to push in all ways. Uh, to ins to try to move toward equity and who is even put into prison. Um, Desmond, you're muted. You want to say final words because we're coming up to the end of the show. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I wanted just to just uh, respond to Ms. Hauser that you know, I appreciate the comments um, and. It, it means a lot that you are up at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, to, to, uh, to, to be with us, to join us. Um, and you're right, you know, someone asked me the other day, you know, how do you talk to Republicans? And I looked at them and I thought for a while, a long while, really contemplated that question. And you know, my response was, I talk to people. I talk to people. And, you know, I do believe that that we have the ability now in Florida because of what we're able to do with, uh, with 1.4 million uh, potential new voters in a state where a Congress, a congressional race decided by 15,000 votes, uh, a, a gubernatorial race by 30,000 and a presidential by 100,000. We have over 1.4 million now people uh, and about 2 million of their family members who don't vote, who didn't vote, but voted, but came out to vote for their loved ones. All right, so we have this, this uh, 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 constituency of voters now that have the ability to shake up the status quo, to unrig the system, and to have both sides uh, really rethink or go back to their uh, uh, drawing board and come back out knowing that they have to earn our votes. They have to do, they have to move issues along. They have to learn how to work together and not get caught up in what we're seeing today to where there's actually almost like a stalemate and nothing is getting done because so both sides are so entrenched. And I think that, um, you know, you know in, in the Bible, they always talk about how the least shall be first, you know, how God always uses the least among a group of people to bring about the biggest change. I think that you know now these folks who was once considered the scourge of the earth could be the ones that can actually uh, help our this country uh, get back to doing business the right way, um, and I'm looking forward to that. I think that um, that you all can play a real role in this, um, and and not only just helping with our registration, but helping to drive that narrative that there is a greater force out there that can overcome the hate and the fear 
uh, that is so prevalent in our in our society. And if we embrace the returning citizens uh, and and let them allow them that space to uh, 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 experience this process as well as be the lead in this process, I think that there are so many great things that's going to come from that. And so in closing, I want to just thank you all again. Um, you know, you guys were, uh, you know, in, in the words of, from the streets, you guys were off the chain uh, as it relates to really helping out, you know, in our efforts. Um, I have the receipts. I have all the receipts. I know every UU church or chapter that turned in, mailed in petitions to me, I have them all, I have them re on record. Um, and you guys were amazing. Let me just share this one thing real quick that I thought was also amazing feat. Um, we ran the largest faith-based uh, in congregational engagement campaign that this country has ever seen, where we had over 827 congregations of faith participate in Let My People Vote uh, a congregational campaign. Now, let me tell you the significance of it. We had the uh, synagogues, we had uh, Islamic mosques, we had conservative Christians, we had Latino conservatives, we had African Americans, we had UUs. All of those religions actually came together under one banner and one voice. I am to sorry me, that to say amazing. that we're at the top of the hour, but you oh, know, it so, would be great to have you come and talk just about that. Yes, I mean, yes, that, that was amazing. Really, really exciting. We've had Christine Dance, who's been posting from Florida, saying she was part of this and that it, the training and the phone banking was amazing and that the campaign was, she said, the easiest thing to do to preach it from my pulpit. Thank you so much, Desmond Mead, Patrice Curtis, and all of the people in Florida who did this wonderful piece of work. Next week, we'll have Nancy McDonald Ladd talking about her new book, Progressive Faith Beyond Optimism. Have a great week and stay warm wherever you are. Almost.